Good morning, and welcome to this uh, second service of the Benton Church of Christ. We had a very good number this morning, 107, and we have a, a great number this afternoon, this next service as well. So thank you for being here. We want to also welcome those who are joining us remotely via WITB radio or by live stream or Facebook. And we're looking forward to the time when we don't have to have multiple services and uh, anybody that wants to can come and not be afraid of uh, this dreaded disease. So um, our speaker this morning will be Joseph Cartwright. Here's our summer intern. I got to hear him once already, so I'm actually excited about hearing him again. Little spoiler alert, he runs the gamut of theologians from John Newton to VeggieTales. So it's a, it's a great lesson. So uh, we look forward to hearing that again. So, but this morning we've assembled uh, to uh, worship our God and remember his son Jesus. And uh, as we get started, I want to read from Ephesians 5, starting with verse 18 where we are exhorted to be filled with the Spirit by speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and to submit to one another in the fear of God. Scott? Let's be standing this morning as we sing together. Sing the love flowing down from the thorn-covered ground. Sing the song, save my soul. Wash it wider than so. Faithful love, comforting spirit, reaches down, rising sheer. Holds my hand when I can't stand on my own. Faithful love, from above, came to her. Yeah. 
Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful to be able to gather here this morning and, and be able to lift up our voices and to sing songs of praise to you, Father. It's a privilege to be able to come before you. We pray that we'll do so in a manner that's pleasing to you and that we'll open up our hearts, Father, that we'll uh, listen and, and, and think about the words that we're singing, that we will open our hearts as we pray to you and as we uh, prepare to hear a message from your word, Father. Help us to be open to allowing it to touch our hearts and to help transform us, Father, into the people that you'd like us to be. Pray for those that are not here with us due to sicknesses, and uh, we pray that you would give them healing, whether it be physical or spiritual. We know we have several on the prayer list, and uh, we just pray that you'll give them relief. Pray for any families that might be grieving, that you'll give them a spirit of peace. And Father, as we each try to go through our week and uh, we try to just be the people you want us to be. Give us the strength to do that and to fight against those things that would tempt us so easily. Uh, help us to be bold enough to stand up for your word and to live out, uh, live out your word, Father, and to just simply uh, be Christians and to show love to others. Father, we're thankful for our leadership here and for the, the decisions they've made as we've been able to continue to be able to gather together and worship you. We pray that you continue to be with them and give them wisdom. Thankful for our ministers here and for all the work that they do, uh, be it known, Father, or even many things that they do uh, to help us and to help others, Father, that maybe just aren't always on the forefront. We're thankful for them. We're thankful for our interns this summer. Uh, we're thankful for the efforts they put in in an uh, unusual summer. We're thankful uh, for all of their efforts, and we pray that you will uh, give them uh, good semesters as they go back to college. Protect, pray that you protect all of us, Father, physically and spiritually, against the wiles of the devil. Thank you, for most of all, for your son, Thank you for his death on the cross and for his blood that continues to cleanse us. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. I actually was thinking uh, that was the perfect song for what I wanted to um, speak about um, for the Lord's Supper and, and making and then preparing our minds this morning. Um, a man of sorrows. Uh, hallelujah. What a Savior. 
It's a really a beautiful song. Um, I, want, I want to start and read a passage from Isaiah 53. Um, I'm going to start in verse 3. It says, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, you consider that he was cut, cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. Isaiah wrote of this man of sorrows before he was even alive, Jesus, the man who died for us, our iniquities laid on him. Even before he was alive, he was to die for us the very people that put Jesus on the cross through our sin. Let's remember the love that was demonstrated for us by Jesus right now, at this time. Let's remember the love that he showed for us, a man of sorrows. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we're humbled because of the, the love that Jesus has shown for us. Um, the way that he's treated us even though we were sinners. God, we ask that you help us now to, to focus our minds, to truly focus on that love and, and to help us to demonstrate that same sacrificial love and, and your love to send your son down the cross. And um, we hope that at this time, as we partake of the bread, that we can focus on that sacrifice. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. God, we come again to you in prayer, remembering the blood of Jesus, a man of sorrows upon the cross, whom we cr crucified. It helps to, uh, to think about the sin that we have in our lives, to put it in perspective, to realize that he was there because of the iniquities that we laid on him. God, we thank you for that, for Jesus to die for us, his willingness, that even though he wished for this cup to pass, he still took it. A man who was to die before he even was alive. God, we thank you. Help us to focus once more as we partake of the blood. Amen.
offering this time. Uh, I want to say a prayer for um, for the continued sacrificial uh, offering that has been a, a part of this congregation for so long, um, and from you know the days of the early church. For, uh, um, every Sunday, you know, First uh, Corinthians sixteen two says that we're supposed to give every Sunday, and that's been something that uh, the, this church has, has done wonderfully, and we're very blessed and. Um, I'm thankful to be a part of a congregation that's so wonderful uh, in, in that aspect. And so uh, let's pray at this time. God, we thank you for the ways that you've blessed us materialistically, financially. I thank you um, for the ease that we have in our lives, uh, the place that we're able to live. Uh, and the beauty that's in that. God, we ask that you allow us not to take that for granted, to always recognize that it comes from you, that the ease and comfort that we have in life is from you, and we are, we are but stewards. And we ask that you help us now uh, to remember what you've given us so that we might sacrifice to give sacrificially back what you've given to us. Um, once again, thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
scripture reading this morning comes from Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, to the great, to go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed to Tarshish, where he went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for, bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. You may be seated. Well, good morning, Benton family. It is a joy and a privilege uh, to be among each and every one of you this morning. And I'm so tremendously thankful for this opportunity I've been given to speak and to really share what God has put on my heart. You know, I had a thought the other day that I've really been trying to, to put into words. And that thought is, uh, with just reflecting on my time here in Benton, I thought how crazy it is to, to leave a place different than when you entered into it. How crazy it is to leave a place different than when you entered into it. And what I mean by that is, is it's so awesome to think how this place has really changed and bless my life. Although this summer is not what anyone could have expected, God really used this place to strengthen my love and my passion for ministry. And I have been to thank for that. And this place will always hold a special place in my heart. I want to say a special thank you to the elders for allowing me to serve here this summer and how much of a blessing their leadership has been and how thankful I am that we've had this opportunity to gather together and to worship together. Uh, I want to say a very special thank you to Mark for helping me prepare this message this morning and for being a constant encouragement and for always offering me wisdom. I appreciate you for that. Uh, I'm so thankful for Sydney Phillips and the work that she's done for the girls in our youth group. Uh, the encouragement and the blessing and light that she's been in their lives has been a huge blessing. Uh, I'm so thankful for each of you that make up the Benton Church of Christ for blessing me spiritually, financially, and for just encouraging me. There's something really special here in Benton, Kentucky, and I'm so thankful I could, have, I could be a part of it. Now, I think that's everyone I wanted to thank. Uh, so if you have a Bible, we're going to be reading in Jonah chapter 1. I'm just kidding. Um, words will never be able to describe how much Nathan uh, means to me and how much of a light and a blessing he's been in my life. I actually accepted this internship without the certainty of having, of having him here this summer. And man, now I can't even imagine my life without him. He may not have taught me how to be a good fisherman this summer, uh, based on the picture. That was actually uh, the only fish I caught this summer, my little uh, bass. So he didn't teach me much. Um, anyway, but um, what he did teach me um, was far better. It was far better. I learned the importance of becoming all things to all men to win souls over to, to Christ. For the sake of the gospel, um, I learned the importance of, of being well-rounded and just living life to its fullest. Uh, I look up to his example as a Christian, husband, father, and servant in the church. And I hope to emulate a lot of the qualities that he possesses. I'm so thankful for Nathan and that he's a part of my life. So this morning, if you have a Bible, we're going to be reading in Jonah chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. And I'm going to go ahead and read this whole chapter because there's a lot of good that I want us to gain from it. Uh, I'm going to read this and then pray for us. So Jonah chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. And it says this. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call it against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with him to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and he cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. Verse 7, And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know on whose, evil, whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. 
Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And what people are you? And I love it here in verse 9. And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land. But they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it has pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Verse 17, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Let me pray for us. Well, Lord, I just want to thank you so much for this time that we have to gather together and worship you. And Lord, I think during this time of um, quarantining and social distancing and just finding some new sense of normal, Lord God, I think that you're instilling in our hearts our need for one another, that we need in us. But Lord, you're also making us realize that the church isn't just, a pl- isn't just a building where we meet together, but that we are the church. We are the church, Lord. And God, I pray that you would make us aware of the gifts that you have given us and that we would use them for your glory because the world needs that right now. The world needs you and the world, need- we need your help to bless the world, Lord and to point a broken and lost world to you, our almighty Savior, our hero of history. Lord God, I'm so thankful for the story of Jonah. There's so much good in this, God, and I just pray that ultimately your message would be preached. I pray that no words of mine would come, uh, would come out of my mouth, and if they do, I pray that they would fall on deaf ears. God, please speak to your people this morning throughout your word. God, I'm so thankful for Jesus. Thank you for his sacrifice. Thank you for the freedom we have in him. We love you, Lord. We trust you. Use this time. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. On January 13th, 2012, disaster struck the Italian ship, the Costa Concordia, as the captain had had set a course far too close to the shore. The ship had struck a rock formation, uh, causing a massive hole on the right side of the ship, causing it to capsize. Panic struck the hearts of over 4,000 souls aboard. Um, uh, uh, Evacuation procedures were underway. Life jackets were being handed out. Uh, Unfortunately, lifeboats uh, were slowly being deployed because they didn't know how to react in this uh, insane situation. Um, And lifeboats or local boats and helicopters were there assisting. So as the people were desperately trying to be rescued, and in this moment of immense panic, the captain of the ship, Francesco Scatino, abandoned his duty for caring for the passengers and fled the ship by lifeboat. Now, if you know anything about the duties of a cruise ship captain, which I can't say that I do, but you would know that the captain's legal and noble responsibility is to his ship and those embarked on it. And that in an emergency situation, he will either save them or he will, he will die trying. Captain Scatino failed miserably at his duty, and so much so that he was sentenced to 16 years in Italian prison, including one year for abandoning his passengers, five, uh, five for, for causing the shipwreck, ten for manslaughter of its, of its victims, because unfortunately 32 people lost their lives, all while Scatino stood safely at the shore. Captain Scatino's duty and calling was to ensure the safety of his passengers, but he fled from that duty. He ran away from it. Now, why tell you that? Because we have a tendency to flee. 
we have a tendency to flee. And more specifically, we have a tendency to flee what God is calling us to. We see in verse 2, Jonah was called by God to go to Nineveh and to call it against it. But then we read in verse 3, but Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish. In the same way Captain Scatino was called to ensure the safety of his passengers, Jonah was called to ensure that the truth was being spread to Nineveh. And yet both of these men fled from what they had been called to do. And it's the same way for us, that God has called us to be about the things that he's about and the work that he's doing in our world, but at times we flee from that because maybe we see it as too difficult, too intimidating, too daunting, or we feel far too unequipped or unready for the task at hand. And it makes absolutely no sense for us to live our lives away from the source of life. That makes no sense. Now, I understand that our calling may not be to ensure the safety of passengers on a cruise ship, and we may not be called to evangelize to a whole city and to call out against it, but I do believe that each of our callings are unique and different, and they all share a like-minded goal because 1 Peter 2.21, we're given a call to follow in Christ's footsteps. When it says, For this you have been called because Christ also, also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. You know, it's so frustrating for me to read the story of Jonah because if I'm honest, it so perfectly describes my life and my story. When I was 14 years old, I decided to give my life to Jesus, to be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins and to walk in the newness of life. Um, I, I was so excited for everything that God was calling me into. It was like I was given a new identity and a new calling I was become, becoming more active with my youth group. I was seeking out ways to be a blessing to those around me. I actually got to baptize a close friend of mine a couple months after my own baptism. Life was great for me. And on top of that, I got to enter into my first dating relationship with this girl that I was crushing on for years. Life was awesome. It was going great. But in the midst of all of it, in the midst of all this goodness that was happening in my life, something changed. Something changed. I started pushing my friends and my family away. I was no longer concerned with being a blessing to those around me. And, and I really didn't care to be a part of my youth group. And if I'm honest, I actually spent a lot of time complaining about my youth group. The servant's heart that I was beginning to develop turned into a very selfish one. And one where I only sought out things that would benefit me. I no longer depended on God to be my source of life and love, and I looked to the things that were tangible of the world to bring me any sort of joy. I ran away from God, and I I ran away from my calling, and I'll talk more on that later. Let's get back to the story of Jonah. Why did he run from his calling? The reason that Jonah ran away from his calling is the same reason why we run. Sin. Sin. Now, we can speculate here that Jonah could have been extremely afraid to go to Nineveh. We can read God's woe to Nineveh in uh, Nahum chapter 3. He says, Behold, I am against you, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will lift up your skirts over your face, and I will make nations look at your nakedness and kingdoms at your shame. This is some really intense stuff in the text. And, And if you read more, you can see just a glimpse of the wickedness of Nineveh. Um, But what you need to understand about Nineveh is that it was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And it was a large and prominent city in its day. Ancient historians say that Nineveh was the largest city in the world at that time. It was the large and important capital of a dominating empire. Surely an intimidating place to go. So what's interesting here is God knows exactly how wicked these people are and exactly how much power they possess. And he tells Jonah, that's exactly where I want you to go. That's where I'm calling you, Jonah. So going back to the speculation on if Jonah was afraid, no, Jonah wasn't afraid of the people of Nineveh. He didn't fear they would kill him for calling, for calling out against him, uh, or, or he didn't feel like the task was too great for God to forgive them. We can read on in Jonah chapter 4. After Jonah had done what he'd been called to do, the people of Nineveh actually repented, and they worshiped God. And it was this awesome, incredible moment of God redeeming this broken city. But Jonah was upset, and he said to God in verse 2 of chapter 4, And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. 
And Jonah didn't feel like these people deserved that. He didn't feel they deserved it. So we can see from this text that Jonah hated the people of Nineveh. Didn't feel they were worthy of God's mercy and his grace. So because of Jonah's sin of holding hatred in his heart for these people, Jonah fled God's call. He ran away from it. And we read Jonah 1 verse 3, But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And the sad reality of our lives is that there will always be an opportunity to run away from what we're called to. Or in relating to this story, there will always be a boat. There will always be a boat. What I love about God, though, is that he is far too loving to let us stay in our sin. He doesn't keep us there. Jonah 1 verse 4, But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. And this brings, brings us to our second point this morning. God has a tendency to pursue us. He has a tendency to pursue us. Jonah attempted to flee to Tarshish, which in our time is like us being called to go evangelize to New York, and then it's saying, okay, cool, I'm going to go to California just to catch a flight to go all the way to Tokyo. That's how far Jonah was trying to flee from God. But God sent a storm. God sent a storm, and he does the same thing in our lives. You know, how oftentimes do plans blow up in our face, or we face discouragement? God doesn't send these storms in our life to hurt us, but to help us, to help us, to deepen our dependency on him, to fully rely on him. He doesn't send, it to send them to hurt us, but to help us. God is saying, Jonah, you can't run from me. I'm the God of the sea. I'm the God of the dry land, and I have a greater calling for your life. What I want us to notice here is Jonah's response after the sailors were questioning how this storm was caused by him. Verse 9, and he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And skipping down to verse 11 of chapter 1, then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea, and the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Jonah's response should be the same as ours when we realize that we're fleeing from God. A response of surrender. We have to surrender. Verse 15, so they picked up Jonah and they hurled him into the sea and the sea ceased from its raging. Jonah knows that he's running from the God who controls the universe. So he says here, God, I have fled from you and I couldn't have been more wrong. So I surrender my life to you. I'll allow these men to throw me into the sea. And, my, and that's my hope for us this morning. That we would live our lives in full surrender to God. Saying, Lord, I'm yours. That oftentimes I think I know what's best for me, but I don't. And I've been broken, I've been discouraged, and I'm going to deepen my dependability on you because I know that you are a good dad. And you've gotten me taken care of. And how sweet it is to know that our God allows a bunch of broken people like us to be rescued by him to be set free by him. It's time for us as the church to reclaim our calling. Earlier when I talked about how I had ran away from God, it wasn't until God sent a storm in my life that really brought me back to him. Uh, in December of 2016, I went through a breakup, which absolutely crushed me. I was devastated. The whole life that I was building uh, was taken away from me. I was lost, I was broken, I was discouraged, I didn't know where to go or what to do. And so in this pit of hopelessness that I found myself in, I made a promise to God. I said, God, if you get me out of this, I'll dedicate my life to you. I'm yours, Lord. I'm yours. And it didn't feel immediate at the time, but in hindsight, God began working wonders in my life. I got to meet with my youth minister and I asked him if I could be his intern my senior year and begin learning about ministry, uh, which I later received and was so tremendously blessed by. I started investing in the people around me and seeking ways to be a light in their lives. 
I was given several ministry opportunities that birthed within me a call to full-time ministry and pursuing a career as a minister. I reclaimed my calling. I reclaimed it. And I love Jonah's prayer in chapter 2 when he says in verses 5 and 6, The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit. Oh, Lord, my God. You know, how many of us during this time of quarantining and social distancing have found ourselves in a pit? And what I mean by that is in this pit of of discouragement and really just being confused. God, what are you working in our world today? What are you doing? This isn't how things are supposed to be. And I feel like I've asked so many people, how are you getting through 2020? How are you making it? And so their answer will be, I don't know. I'm just trying to survive at this point. I'm just trying to make it. And to be honest, that was my answer too. It's just felt like so often times I would start to gain some traction or momentum or I'm just like, man, I'm really getting somewhere here. That something would always come to bring me down and to push me back into this pit. It's been so, 2020 has been so annoying in that regard. My mind would cling on to one discouraging moment or thought and the devil would use that to completely diminish my thought process completely ruin any positive thinking I have in my mind or anything that was true about me and what was happening. And if I'm honest with you this summer, I found myself in the pit this summer. I found myself in the pit. But I didn't stay there. And I'm not there right now because I've also experienced a closeness with God. I've never experienced before this summer. This summer I found the verse, Revelation 2, verse 4, and it really spoke to me and what I was going through. But when it says, you have abandoned the love you had at first. You've abandoned it. I allowed a circumstance and a negative mindset to push me into this pit, which caused me to forget the love I had at first. It caused me to forget how good Jesus was and how much he saved me and how I was called to something bigger than myself. And if I'm honest with you, I've had a thought um, this summer and in my life, whenever I'm going to college, pursuing my degree in Bible, I've had this thought that it would be a lot easier to do something else. It'd be a lot easier to do something else. It'd be a lot easier for me to pursue a business degree and work at some business that I only halfway care about. It would be a lot easier for for me to completely throw out my dreams of ministry, to walk away from it and and pursue a a normal job, right? But God's calling is never easy, and he is always faithful. God's calling is never easy, and he's always faithful. And the reason I stay in this, the reason I keep doing it, is because I feel called. I feel called to. Someone here this morning needs to remember their first love. The first time you fell in love with Jesus and reclaim your calling. Reclaim it. Because each and every morning we're given a choice if we will follow Jesus or if we'll pursue the desires of our flesh. Um, We see in Jonah chapter 3 how Jonah preached the shortest sermon ever. In verse 4, chapter 3, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And we read the very next verse. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. When Jonah pursued his calling, the Ninevites were saved. This is a perfect example of how powerful the gospel is that it caused a wicked city to surrender into the arms of God. We read on in chapter 4 of Jonah's anger that God had saved Nineveh. And it's such a strange chapter, and it ends so abruptly, but it really reveals God's heart and his compassion towards broken people like us. And he even extends grace to Jonah whenever he's all bent out of shape and asking uh, God to kill him. Um, I found this, one of the most helpful resources that I have, uh, that I studied from for this lesson in the story of Jonah uh, was Veggie Tales. And um, I'm not kidding. 
the the the, veg, the Jonah VeggieTales is one of the best movies ever made. Um, you need to watch it. But towards the end of it, whenever they're explaining what's going on, uh, whenever they're explaining the very last chapter of Jonah, uh, they sing this song, and they sing, "Jonah was a prophet, ooh ooh, but he never really got it. Sad but true. But and if you watch him, you can spot it." I doodly do. He did not get the point. He did not get the point. But the song continues talking about God when they sing compassion and mercy from me to you and you to me. Exactly what God wants to see. And yes, that is the point. That's the point. So I'll leave you with one last story. And the sermon is yours. So John Newton he grew up a boy who was nurtured by a Christian mother, but he had a really rough dad. His mother passed away shortly after contracting tuberculosis when Newton was only seven years old. So at the age of 11, Newton picked up his father's trade of becoming a sailor, and most of his journeys were on merchant ships. In 1743, while going to visit friends, Newton was captured, pressed into the naval service by the Royal Navy. Uh, Newton actually tried to escape the ship, but was caught, punished in front of a crew of 350, taught, stripped to his waist, tied to a grating and received a flogging of over eight dozen lashes. Newton was a bitter man after his humiliation in front of the crew, contemplating the murder of the captain, and he actually attempted suicide by throwing himself off the ship. Which, and this is a bit graphic, but the way that the crew saved him was by getting a whale harpoon and by impaling his side and bringing him back on the ship. The crew hated John Newton. He wasn't liked very much. He eventually was left in West Africa where a slave trader took him and handed him over to his wife who would beat Newton much more than the other slaves. Newton was actually hated so much that he was below the slaves, being forced to eat the scraps that the slaves would drop on the, food, uh, on the floor. Um, a friend of John's father actually saved him from slavery, and yet despite the fact that he was set free, he allowed bitterness to consume him by drowning his sorrows in alcohol. And he actually became very well involved in the buying and selling of slaves in West Africa. But all that changed in 1748. And when Newton was aboard a Liverpool ship on its homeward journey, the ship was overtaken by a massive storm. So Newton cried out to God saying, God, save me. And miraculously, the ship's cargo filled the hole that was in the side of the ship, allowing them to get safely back to shore, thus beginning Newton's conversion story. After Newton's conversion, he became very well known for his pastoral care. And when word came that Newton was preaching the gospel, people would fill these churches just for the chance to hear him. What I love about Newton's story is it's a story of God's grace being shed on someone that we could easily consider as too far gone. John Newton, despite the many battles of bitterness he fought in his life, wrote a hymn that you may be familiar with. And in that hymn, he declares... Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. It saved a wretch like me. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believe. We serve a God who extends his grace to us, who could never deserve it. And not because of anything that we've done, but because of what he has already done for us. Despite our times of running away from our calling, God's love chases after us. It chases after us and offers us that amazing grace. That amazing grace is offered to you this morning. It's time for us to fix our eyes on Jesus and to run into his arms, remembering that he is our first love. Let's embrace every good and perfect gift that he's given us with gratitude, running into the calling we formerly ran away from. I'm done running. I'm done running. And I hope you are too. It's time to reclaim our calling. God's calling is never easy. 
He's always faithful. He's always faithful. The invitation this morning is extended to you, and I hope that each of you know that you have a church family here that loves you, that wants to invest in you, that wants to pray over you. Um, Don't leave this morning if you have a need that we can help you with. Or if you want to make the best decision of your life this morning by being baptized into Christ, by being, becoming dead, dying to yourself and living a new life in Christ, there are waters here for you to be baptized. Whatever your need may be, please come as we stand, as we sing. Joseph, thank you for that wonderful lesson. It was great from a biblical perspective, but your personal story makes it even that much better. So thank you for bringing us that message, and thank you for being with us this summer. It's been a weird summer. Uh, We're glad that you came anyway. We're glad for all the time that you were able to spend with the youth. I'm sure you wanted to spend more. I'm sure they wanted to spend more with you, but that didn't work out. But thank you for coming, and hopefully you've been changed in a good way and that you'll find things that will allow you to do your ministry even better in the future. And Sydney, thank you for the time that you spent with our girls and our youth, and uh, we're glad that uh, we had you here to do that. So uh, in our closing prayer, we have several to remember. Um, We express our sympathy to the family of Casey Prescott, who passed away this past week. She was the daughter of Lori Jaco, who is known, uh, who works at uh, MTG. Uh, We need to continue to remember George Taylor, who came forward last Sunday asking for prayers. Uh, Larry Farmer's procedure at Vanderbilt was successful, and he is home feeling well. His next series of treatments will begin in September. Jerry Johnston, a former member here, received a good report that his lungs were clear. He will go back to the doctor next week to find out what his next steps will be in his fight with sarcoma. James Jones fell this past week and injured his shoulder. He will see an orthopedic surgeon on August 6th. Mickey Turek, the brother-in-law of Taylor Odom, has been diagnosed with COVID-19, and they've asked that we keep him and his wife and three children in our prayers. Judy Adkins is back at her apartment and doing better. Ruby Nelson, who's a six-year-old cousin of Corey Westerfield, was admitted to the hospital recently, and doctors fear that her body is rejecting her liver transplant. Uh, Nancy Thrill, Phil, a neighbor and friend of Bob and Ann York, has been diagnosed with cancer and asked for our prayers. And then Russell Jones uh, let me know this morning that uh, he will have cancer surgery tomorrow to remove a uh, skin cancer from his head. So we need to remember Russell. Let's bow. Uh, most gracious God in heaven, we thank you that we can come to you with our petitions and prayers, uh, knowing that you are listening to us because we are your children. And dear Father, we ask that you would be with the Casey Prescott family and comfort them in her loss. Uh, be with George Taylor and help him in his daily life to... Uh, 
to live for you and to uh, be able to take care of the, the influences in his life. We thank you that Larry Farmer's procedure went well and continue to be with him in his recovery and help him in his next series of treatments. Uh, thank you that Jerry Johnson had a good report and be with him in his next steps as he fights his sarcoma. Help James Jones to be healed uh, by the orthopedic surgeons so that he can uh, get back to a normal use of his body. Continue to be with uh, Ty Taylor Odom's brother-in-law, help him in his fight against COVID. Thank you that Judy Atkins is doing well. Uh, continue to be with Ruby Nelson and help her uh, to uh, her body to not reject her liver. Um, be with Nancy Phil, help her in her cancer, and be with Russell Jones tomorrow as he uh, undergoes cancer surgery as well. Dear Father, we thank you that you are a God who pursues us, and uh, forgive us, dear God, for being the type of people that flee. Our sheep-like tendencies come out, and uh, we tend to flee when we should be standing firm. And forgive us for that, dear Father, and give us courage and give us wisdom and help us to stand more for you. And Thank you for Joseph, and thank you for Sydney for the work they've done here this summer and for the influence they've had on our youth, and uh, bless them in their, their, their schooling and bless them in all their lives. Thank you for your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. And other announcements, if you brought food to uh, any of the recent uh, funerals, you may have dishes in the foyer. Uh, also, so this Wednesday night, our summary series speaker will be Dale Sadler of the Birdsboro Church of Christ. We'll have assembly at 6.30. It'll also be on live stream, Facebook, and on the radio. Uh, and then this Wednesday night at the same time, we'll have classes in the uh, gymnasium for the third, fourth, and fifth graders. Uh, and the middle school and high schoolers will have a devotional at 7.30 Wednesday night. And don't forget our services tonight, 6 p.m., WITB radio, Facebook, and live stream, but we'll have no uh, in-person assembly. Uh, and at this time, uh, Dave Simmons has an announcement regarding the BTC. Good morning. And I thank the eldership for providing an opportunity to, uh, to come up and just share briefly some good news uh, and, and share about the impact the Benton Church uh, is having in Africa and all parts of the world in, in growing God's kingdom. So yesterday, uh, the graduating class from the Benin Bible Training Center, 21 graduates representing four countries, uh, had their ceremony yesterday. And you may know that that's a little change, uh, and due to the virus, uh, part of that Sunday service is a very large worship service with a thousand or more, along with graduation. Uh, so that was a decision made to make that adjustment, and the graduation ceremonies uh, went to 50 people. So the other change you may notice uh, is that rather than just uh, a group of men standing there, uh, that you see wives and some of the children, there's many more, but that was made possible over the last year uh, through the married housing that was put on campus. And that will be something that we'll look to continue to grow uh, and increase the housing available for funds. But reuniting those families, uh, that is, has been a major, major source of good news. And all these things are things which I would like you to take joy in, especially in this time. Uh, this is all fruit that's come into bear uh, over many years uh, in this church, the leadership that this church has provided and the support that you all have provided. Uh, but this is Constantine from Burkina Faso. And rather than him uh, there for three years on campus uh, being dedicated to uh, and dedicating his life to the gospel, his family is there reunited with him. Uh, Burkina Faso is a dominant Muslim nation. Uh, it'll be a tough work there, uh, but they're effective there. Uh, Bibles are being distributed, uh, people are being saved, the gospel's being preached, but uh, that family's together. So I wanted to just share that good news with you. Also, Ajayi, uh, who many of you met, uh, now that George is more in a mentorship role out in the field, uh, he has embraced and taken that role of directorship on and, and doing and thriving in that role. Uh, but there's Ajayi uh, in the diploma with one of the graduates. The last part of the uh, ceremony, if you will, uh, is where, where everyone is praying over those graduates. And this is not them being ordained, uh, but they are laying hands on them and, and praying. 
because the very next step, and I'm talking Monday morning step, is to be on the mission field. Pioneer missionaries, planting churches, uh, going places, uh, and preaching in the name of Jesus Christ and, and saving lives, changing lives. So they're praying over them, and it's a powerful moment. I wanted to take this moment to, to share a message. This is from one of the graduates who's in the DRC Congo. And if you know about Africa and the Congo, is probably one of the most challenging, toughest places to be, but this work is thriving there. They've started a little satellite school, almost like the BTC, but not, not on the scale, but uh, this is we, developing disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And along that, they're modeling what George has done. And so all this fruit that's coming to count. But I want to share this message from Brother Gabriel. I urge you to pray. Pray a lot for our donors and for our missionary brother George, as well as for ourselves, that the Lord gives us the courage and strength to do the work as the Lord has entrusted us with. We'll let this pandemic continue its way, but it does not discourage for us. Let's take our weapons and stand up, for nothing will stop us from doing our work. Our only motto, let's work and fight to death and be faithful to our master. With love, Brother Gabriel. When you look at the beginning of this, uh, I can't speak for you, but from, for me, I'm nowhere near smart enough to even think about how to make all this happen, let alone be able to dream it. But what you're seeing are the fruits that are coming to bear from, from faith and from the hard work on the ground in this model. And when you look at a simple yet very faithful and intentional decision uh, that the eldership at that time and Bill Morgan and Ed Jones saying we are going to support, oversee, and encourage and partner with this missionary named George Ockpobley, who we haven't met but comes on good accord. And we, we've, we've spoke with him, and we think this is going in the right direction. And to just make faithful decisions and to stay true and hard work, to think that 233 men now have graduated through the Benin Bible Training Center, over 350 congregations of the Lord's Church has been planted in 11 nations and a very important part of the world, uh, that 1040 zone that is either going to be uh, where Islam filters further south or where Christianity heads north. That's the reality of it. And so this is the most important work. This is the most important work in the world, both in general and specifically, helping people to know Jesus and preaching the gospel. In this model, in this church, it's what we do best by developing natives and empowering them to, to be self-supporting and for them to go and replicate. So I, I just share that good news that I'm privileged to be included in it, privileged to share that today. Let this be a source of joy for you and, and also to remember them in prayers as we see the, the publicity and, and in the Chronicle and uh, and in other areas, and more people are becoming aware of this, more resources are coming in, and, and uh, I'm just so excited to see uh, what's going to be in store. Uh, if you like to get our update, our face-to-face, -face, our newsletter, if you want to get more involved, I, I encourage you to contact me, uh, and it's not hard to do. Any, just pull me aside or, or send me a text or a message, call anything, and, and I'll make sure that you get that. But I'm going to close just uh, with two things. One, as you may can assume with the situation that uh, Brother George's annual trip here will not happen this year. Uh, that decision was made, but right now as we sit today, there's no flights in or out of Ghana or Benin. So he will not be coming, but that will again not slow us down. And in the spirit of this graduate, nothing will prevent us from doing that work. So uh, we will be doing some Zoom. Uh, we will be doing, uh, I will be traveling uh, where uh, we're allowed some of the congregations uh, just prefer us to not come, and some are welcoming. So um, things will look a little different, but we're viewing it as an opportunity to engage with more and more uh, and doing that even remotely. So uh, just want to let you know that, but I'll close with, you know, if, if, if you as an individual want to be more involved, uh, there's certainly opportunities and ways to do it. Uh, but specifically today, I'm going to ask us to reflect and remember the power of prayer and what God has done and it is doing. 
And I'm going to ask you, if you're interested in being a prayer warrior, and praying for one of these graduates and that family, specifically by name, please see me. Please contact me because I'd love to provide you their name, provide you their photo, provide you where they're going. And there's real power in that. There's real power in that. And so I just ask you to consider that. But also the main thing is to just share this good news with you and, and uh, what a joy it's been. You know, God, this is his work. But he did need a church for it to start with. And he needed a church to be the, the foundation and driver of it. He chose the Benton Church of Christ. Of all the options, of all the places in this country, all the churches with the resources that they have, the Benton Church of Christ and each and every one of you as members here. So praise God. We thank him for that. It's great news to share. That's all I have.